5.2. Today we're going to evaluate and graph polynomial functions. We've already graphed some polynomial functions. We've graphed a straight line. We've graphed a quadratic, in other words, a parabola. A polynomial is any function that has x to some, some whole number power. If we have x to a decimal or x to a negative, it's not a polynomial. We'll see some examples of polynomials in the next slide. You're also not allowed to have square roots, absolute values. It's got to be a very strict rules for what classifies as a polynomial. Over here on the left, you see some examples of polynomials. And one way we classify polynomials is by its highest degree. If there's no x value at all, we call it constant. If the highest power is x to the first, we call it linear quadratic, cubic, quartic, and so on. There's words for the higher degrees. We won't need to know them for this class. You will have to know these vocab words, these five words that match to the degree of a polynomial. Example one says, decide whether the function is a polynomial function. If so, write it in standard form and state its degree, type, and leading coefficient. So let me talk about things you keep an eye out for. You're only allowed to have whole numbers for your exponents. You're not allowed to have any square roots or negative numbers for your exponents. You can have a square root in the original problem, just not as an exponent. Standard form means write these in order from highest degree to lowest degree. So in part A, you see the highest degree is 4, so you'll write x to the fourth first. And then you decide, yes or no, is this a polynomial? If so, write it in standard form, then state its degree, type, and leading coefficient. Leading coefficient means the number in front of the first term. So go ahead and try that for A. Pause the video. See if you get the same thing as me before we go on to B, C, and D. Turns out that part A is a polynomial. It was already written in standard form, the highest degree down to the lowest degree. That highest degree was 4, so we say its degree is 4. The word that goes with degree 4 is quartic, and the leading coefficient, again, that's the number in front of the highest degree, is 1. So at this point, go ahead and pause the video. Try B, C, and D on your own. If your answer is no, you get to stop right there. Turns out part B is the only other of these that is a quad or is a polynomial. Turns out that it's a quadratic. You have to put your highest degree first, and the degree is two, and the leading coefficient is the number in front. That's pi. Let's talk about why the answer was no on the last two. We're not allowed to have a negative exponent in a polynomial, so automatically we say no. In fact, we're not allowed to have any exponent that's not a whole number. X is a variable, not a whole number. So we say no right away. Next, we're going to use some direct substitution, something you've been doing since probably pre-algebra. It says evaluate this function when x equals 3. And direct substitution just says plug in 3. And next example, I'm going to show you how to do the same problem using much smaller numbers. But before that, Make sure you can do this by hand. This would be totally fair as a non-calculator problem. See if you get the same answer as me. You'll, of course, be using the order of operations. Before we move on to the next problem, which is the same as this problem, I want to point out that the biggest number we had to deal with was 162. We're going to do the same problem on the next slide, but with smaller numbers. Uh, but before that, there's a chance to try some of this on your own, or you can wait and do that later. Example 3 says evaluate by synthetic substitution. Even if you don't feel comfortable with this after you see it the first time, practice, practice, practice. It's going to be super useful, especially as we move on into some of the harder stuff in this chapter, as well as honors pre-cal, regular pre-cal, or calculus. So let's take a look at what synthetic substitution means. First, we look at the original problem from example. Next, we have to check to see if this is written in standard form. 
it is. Again, that means highest degree down to lowest degree. And to use synthetic substitution, you also have to have a polynomial, which we do. Our next step is to write down the number we want to plug in. In this case, it's 3. Then we draw a big kind of upside down division box. Inside this division box, we put all of the coefficients from highest degree to lowest degree in order. So our highest degree is 4, so we put a 2. Our next highest degree is 3, and we put that negative 1. Next highest degree is 1, so we put in negative 4, except that's wrong. You notice what degree seems to be missing from the original problem. It goes degree 4, 3, 1. There's no degree 2, so we have to put a placeholder in. Since there's no degree 2, we write a 0. Then we put our negative 4 and our positive 8. If you still don't see where those numbers are coming from, look up. No 0, no x squared term. Those numbers come straight from there. Our next step for synthetic substitution is to drop down that first number on the inside, drop down the 2. Then we say, what's 3 times 2? 3 times 2 is 6. Now we say, what's negative 1 plus 6? 5. Now we go 3 times 5. 15. 0 plus 15. 15. 3 times 15. And I caught myself on a mistake. See if you can find it before I erase it. There was supposed to be a negative 5 here, not a negative 1. That changes things up a little bit. Instead of a negative 1 in the original problem, you got to put a negative 5. I apologize for being human. Now we try this again. 3 times 2, 6. Add those up, we get 1. 3 times 1, 3. Add those up, we get 3. 3 times 3, 9. Add those up. 3 times 5 is 15. Add those up. And let's look at the biggest number I see in this whole problem. It's 27. And by the way, that last number that we came up with is f of 3. So we would write f of 3 equals 27. The reason I want to point out that the biggest number I even see is 27, if you go back and do regular substitution, remember we came up with a number that was more than five times as big, 162. This is a lot faster, a lot easier. Practice these in the guided practice right away so you can see how much faster it is. Next up, we're going to be looking at end behavior of polynomials. What this chart is basically telling us is that if the degree is odd and the leading coefficient is positive, we're going to have one arrow going up, one arrow going down. And the up is always on the right, down is always on the left. If we have an odd degree with a negative leading coefficient, it's going to be still an up and down, but the up's going to be on the left, down's going to be on the right. If the degree is even, you can see what happens in these next two pictures. Positive coefficient, both arrows go up. Negative, both arrows go down. You'll have to know this for drawing rough sketches of graphs during this lesson even. So you'll come back and reference this information quite a bit. So let's take a look at a standardized test practice. It says, what is true about the degree and the leading coefficient of the polynomial? I see both arrows going down. Since both arrows are going down, if I look at that previous chart, that tells me that it must be an even degree with a negative leading coefficient. So now we just look for that. Part A says degree is odd, no. Part B says degree is odd, no. C says degree is even, leading coefficient positive, almost. Part D says degree is even, leading coefficient negative. Now we're done. At this point, you can practice these on your own. Strongly recommend that you try 6 and 7 using synthetic substitution. Don't use regular substitution. You need to get that practice in. Next up, these are kind of some tough problems. We've got to grasp some stuff that we've never even come close to graphing before. Part A says we've got this cubic. One thing we know is we've got a leading coefficient that is negative and a degree that's odd. So our graph's going to look something like this. Oops. 
If you don't know why it's going to look something like this, go back and look at the previous couple slides ago when it gives you the information about the degree being odd and the in behavior being as it is. Next, we are not going to learn how to graph these as accurately as we possibly can until honors pre-cal and then even better in calculus. For now, I just expect you to make a table. I'm okay with a table that looks like something like this. So, what I want you to do here is pause the video, fill in the table, plot the points, and then draw the arrows in the right direction. See if you get the same thing I do. Key features that I'll be looking for is do you have the arrow going up like you're supposed to on one side, down on the other side, and did you plot some points? A real good point is always the y-intercept, plugging in zero. Next up, go ahead and figure out your end behavior for part B. Draw a little rough sketch like I did for part A. Then make your table and draw it. See if you get the same thing I do. Don't forget to have both arrows pointing up because we had a positive leading coefficient with an even power. If you're wondering about the bumps and how many you should have in your graph, it's a good question. We'll learn a lot more about this in pre-cal. But if you notice on a degree 3, we had two bumps. On a degree 4, we had three bumps. Turns out the number of bumps is always equal to one less than the degree. So part A was a third degree. Lower that by one, you get two. There's going to be two bumps at the most. Part B says we've got degree four. So you lower that by one, you get three bumps at the most. There could actually be less than three, but there's going to be three at the most. And there's going to be three on almost every one of them. That's probably one of the hardest graphs you'll have to do in this class. Next up, go ahead and pause the video, read this, see if you can figure out what's going on. Wind speed is probably going to be positive. So when I'm making my graph, maybe the smallest value I'll use is zero, like no wind speed. And I want to get up to 1,000 pounds of energy per square foot. I don't know what number to really put in to see what's going to happen there. So maybe I'll start with just plugging in zero, and I see that I get zero. I'm trying to get somewhere around 1,000. Playing around in your calculator a little bit. Go ahead and see if you can figure out a number that's going to give us closest to 1,000. A whole number that's closest to 1,000. Let's take a sneak peek into my thought process. First number I tried was 5. My calculator told me that plugging in 5 gives me like 1.8. That didn't sound even close to 1,000. So then I went ahead and tried something like 100. And my calculator blew up gave me a big number, 290,000. That's way too big. So let's not do that. Then I just tried multiplying by, I doubled it again. I tried 10. When I plug in 10, I got 29. Still doesn't seem big enough. Something's going on. So maybe I'll try 20. And I get 464. Getting closer to 1,000. Try 25. I get 1,132. Oops. That's pretty close to 1,000. Might be able to get a little closer. Try 24. And I got 962. That is a little closer. So I know I'm somewhere between 24 and 25. Since I'm just estimating, I would estimate 24. And I kind of cheated. I didn't use the graph. I used my table which comes before the graph. But the nice thing about that is now I can draw the graph using my information that I just found. I'll go from 0 to 25. If you graph this with a graphing calculator, we can come up with a more accurate looking graph. And it turns out that our answer is actually 24.2. But we're just estimating. Let's make sure we use our correct units. S is wind speed in knots. So 24 knots would be a good estimation. That's it. At this point, you can pause the video and try these on your own. 
Otherwise, we're done. This was a long one, but we got through a lot of information.